Good afternoon and hello and greetings from UB. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement and the UB School of Management, we are delighted you are able to join us for today's webinar presentation. My name is Christy Fields and I manage the Alumni Lifelong Learning Program here at UB. I am also joined by my wonderful colleague, Joy Rona, who will be assisting in monitoring any questions. We are both so grateful you are able to join us today as we are in the midst of celebrating this exciting week of homecoming at home, and we hope you and your family are staying well. It is my honor to welcome today's featured presenter, UB alumnus and clinical assistant professor of finance at the UB School of Management, Sudhir Suchik. Sudhir has more than 30 years experience in banking and has developed executive education programs and conducted professional seminars in the application of financial and credit tools in several countries. He has provided consulting and training to community banks on commercial credit and risk management and presented lectures on investments and personal financial management. In today's webinar, Sudhir will speak to the following two scenarios. One, while you may pay your bills on time, you just can't seem to save very much money. And scenario two, your contributions into the 401k retirement plan at work are being invested in mutual funds. However, you're not quite sure what to look for when you monitor the mutual funds performance. These are very common themes which require self-control and setting goals to save and invest and becoming familiar with your investment performance. In today's webinar, Sudhir will share his ex expertise and experience and expand upon these themes. We will leave some time during today's webinar for Q&A. If you have any questions during the presentation, you're gonna see a GoToWebinar taskbar. There's a question section on your screen and you can chat those to us at any time. And then in addition, we are recording today's session and we'll send you all a copy within the next 24 hours. So with that said, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our featured presenter, UB alumnus and clinical assistant professor of finance at the UB School of Management, Sudhir Suchek. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Christy, for the introduction. Uh, I certainly appreciate uh, everyone joining today for this uh, presentation uh, and taking the time to do that. Um, this is a topic, of course, that um, is quite broad. Um, it could take a semester <laughs> to, to, to discuss all of the uh, different, um, uh, different topics that we cover within personal finance. So what I'm going to try to do is, as much as possible, try to cover some of the key areas that may be um, close to you, uh, hopefully. And again, you can certainly ask questions at the end if there's something that I may not have covered or you'd like me to uh, clarify. Again, so what I wanted to do today is, is just start out with this article out of the journal that I had picked out. And it kind of gives you an understanding of what, what average households are going through in, in some respects. Whether it is something that they planned on it or not. So what I'd like to do is, if I could ask you to take a couple of minutes, take a look at this article, focus on the highlighted areas, and, and think about what are some of the glaring issues that you see there with the Guzmans. Um, so I'll let you read through that for a couple of minutes. Now, this is uh, uh, clearly a, a live scenario. It's not made up. And um, it's very recent, of course. Uh, but it is not something that 
uh, occurred during the pandemic. This is the normal lifestyle. Obviously, if I were to ask you what things stand out um, uh, from your from your standpoint, so here is a situation. You know, here is a couple that is um, doing fairly well in terms of income. They both have jobs, relatively good jobs, but high in debt. They have almost uh, four hundred thousand dollars overall in loans. Um, this is starting to stress Mr. Gus um, Guzman. He's not used to this type of situation. Um, and what really stood out for me was that it says they no longer dine out several times a week. Now, right there, there is a red flag. Yeah. Um, several times a week is what kind of caught my eye. The other thing is Ms. Finar um, has a TJ Maxx card, hasn't used it in a year, which is certainly a, a good thing. The balance is $7,500 on that. But what she does is pays the minimum balance, which, by the way, um, is too low, essentially. And it will take her longer time to pay this credit card off. If she does not charge anymore, then I will be able to pay my mortgage on the home. So that's kind of an issue that many people face when they have high credit card balances and only pay the monthly minimum required by the bank. Now, no one expects everyone to be able to pay off everything they charge monthly basis, but effort should be made to increase that amount so that these high interest rate, rate date debts can be depleted quicker than 23 years. Now, the other thing that really surprised me was that, what do you do with your credit cards if you don't need them? Well, Mr. Guzman decided to put all his credit cards, eight of them, eight of them in a Ziploc bag, put water in it, and put it in the freezer. Now, that obviously tells me the fact that he had no intention of ever not using them. And when that happens, it's very easy to take one of them out. And that's exactly what happens when they have certain expenses. And once one, if one of them is removed, now he has removed, taken out all the rest as well. So they're pretty much back to where they started. So it's, it's a lesson here that, that, that we learn that we need to be able to manage expenses. We need to have some control and some discipline when it comes down to debt. Let's go over the presentation. So again, as I pointed out to you that I have try to cover some key areas. Hopefully those are areas that perhaps um, we all think about on a daily basis. So it's a quite a broad agenda. I thought about this when I was talking to my son, and I said, you know, he's in his mid-30s. I said, what kind of things concern you today? What, what are the things that you believe that someone your age could make changes with respect to their um, lifestyles, to their um, expenses that they have and other areas that where they are um, 
on a daily basis that are affecting their lives. And I came up with these five tips based upon the pandemic. I believe that when there is a crisis, there is an opportunity. And that's exactly what he said. Take a look at your mortgage on a home. If you do have a mortgage, consider refinancing. It's an opportunity that we have. Mortgage rates are down to about two and a half percent. Typically, if you have a mortgage that is about a percent higher than current mortgage rates, it is important to take a look at it. It may not work out for you, but it's important to check with um, a bank to find out if you can lower your monthly payments. Consider even going to 15 year mortgage instead of 30 years that you may have. If your rate differential is large between what it is today and what it can be uh, under the refinance. If you drive less, contact your insurance company or mobile insurance company. They do provide discounts on um, insurance policies where individuals do not drive as much as they did before because your existing policy may be based upon how many miles you drive round trip on a daily basis, particularly to work. Health savings account up to $7,100 $7, and plus $1,000 catch up for anyone over 50 years old or $3,550 per year. These are tax deductible. You can save up to 30% or even higher on medical expenses by being able to deduct these and contribute on a tax deductibility basis. Most of us do not have sufficient or enough medical expenses on our tax returns that we can actually take advantage of by deducting those expenses because it is seven and a half percent of adjusted gross income. That's quite a bit of money. Most of us don't have medical expenses out of pocket that are that high. This allows individuals to be able to contribute and be able to reduce their income tax based upon the contributions. They don't expire. They last forever until you are able to use all of that up for medical expenses, co-pays, um, even prescriptions, all of those qualify for um, to be months, funds to be taken out of the health savings account. They are very easy to set up. When it comes down to savings account, take a look at please to the online savings accounts at certain banks, Goldman Sachs, American Express, and several other banks are offering online accounts. They're very easy to set up. They're safe. They insured up to $250,000 per depositor. There's no difference in terms of um, the, um, uh, the assurability if the bank fares, whether your account is online or whether it's at a bank. Rates are not very high right now, but it's higher than what many individuals are earning on the savings account. Today, the average rate on online savings account is between 0.5% to 0.7%. Now that may seem low, but it does grow over time. Have a larger emergency fund. Now again, under normal conditions, six months of savings to cover for emergency, in case of loss of job, medical expense, or some um, unforeseen expenses is reasonable. But today, under uncertain times, it is recommended that a nine month, a nine month emergency fund be, um, be held in a liquid fund, of course, where you can get to it 
online savings account do allow you to deposit and withdraw funds without any um, any limitations. The most limitation on a savings account is that you cannot withdraw more than six times during a month or transfer funds out of your savings account during a monthly statement cycle. After that, the individual is penalized. But as six withdrawals or transfers are allowed, unlimited deposits are allowed. The next thing I wanted to discuss, please, are some common mistakes that we all incur not knowingly in savings and investing. We always try to wait to save money. Well, I'll put it off. When I get a raise, I'll start saving money. Okay. This is never too late and never too early to start. We always tend to wait to save for the last. So we save savings for the last a familiar pattern that we see. Pay yourself first, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Arrange an automated savings from your paycheck into an account. You can set it up with your HR. That provides discipline. Before we know, the amount grows. What you don't see, you don't miss from the paycheck. An automated way of saving is more disciplined than doing it manually. We're not always paying attention to interest rates. Yes, they do change. But again, as I pointed out to you, many banks do offer higher interest, relatively speaking compared to 0.1% or point or a half point zero zero five percent interest on a bank account savings, we can earn up to 10 times that on an online account. When it comes to investing, again, we tend to be sometimes aggressive. We listen to the news, we watch the news, and we try not to do, not to to diversify, it is always important to do that. We'll talk more about diversification of portfolio. It's very tempting to chase certain investments that we hear about, but putting all your eggs in certain few baskets is not a good idea. Be conservative. Make education educated decisions with respect to investing. We, pay, we tend to pay high fees sometimes when it comes to investing. Again, we'll talk more about these later on. We as human beings are rational people. It is quite normal to be rational. And we tend to get emotional when it comes down to investing money. We jump in doing without doing enough enough homework. Just because someone says it's a good investment doesn't mean that it may be good for you or me. Please do the proper research. And we should try to avoid being overconfident. An educated conservative approach to investing is the right approach. Budgeting. So again, I'm trying to cover these, you know, in, in, in terms of order. It's building up the block, apparently. So when it comes to budgeting, of course, for some it is easier and for some it's harder. It's always good to start a budget. 
if we don't have a roadmap, how are we going to know if we are able to achieve our short to long term goals? Without a written document, it's hard to try to imagine and, and think about a budget in our own mind because we'll never do it. You see, always important to know how much we have and how much we owe and what is our net worth. Again, if we have an idea of all of the debt that we have, we can try to identify those high interest rate debt and try to find a way to consolidate the debt. Interest rates are relatively low today. Even on credit cards, we're not saying that we should consolidate on a credit card. But if you take a look at all of the different loans available, you may see an opportunity to consolidate your debt, including student loan debt, if it's a high interest rate loan. Net worth is, of course, the difference between what we owe and what we own. We should always take a look at it. It doesn't mean that we need to look at it every month, but once every six months or a year, we should really reassess that. And the difference between the, the two is the net worth. It may be an eye opener. Net worth grows gradually, of course. In good act in 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 economic times, there are good economic times, the net worth tends to go up more than in bad times, of course. Because we have a steady job, stocks, bonds are doing well, home prices are going up, and all of those factors come into play in terms of the net worth and what we own while we are paying off what we owe at the same time. Please determine your fixed recurring and variable expenses. These are fixed expenses are typically monthly. How often do we prepare a budget? Because many of our fixed expenses are on a monthly basis, rent, mortgage, utilities, it's ideal to prepare a budget on a monthly basis. And yes, there are some uh, expenses that vary on a monthly basis, such as groceries, gasoline, etc. cetera. Okay. Those should also be identified. So a budget should have both fixed and variable expenses identified separately. And there is a reason why we need to do that. Research shows, by the way, is that 25% of the individuals prepare a budget daily. That's overkilling. 25% weekly, 25% monthly, and 25% do not have a budget. Now, what is the right time frame? In my opinion, monthly budget is reasonable. We don't need to, to, to let the budget control us. We control the budget. The more, the more frequently we budget and we take a look at the expenses and income, the more emotional we're going to get. And the quicker we're going to quit, quit doing the budget. But because many of the fixed recurring expenses are monthly, it makes sense to prepare a monthly budget. Always have a written, you can prepare an Excel spreadsheet. There are many software available to different software available to also um, document your income and expenses. Take a look at the bottom line, please. 
that's going to give us an idea as to what do really do we really have to have compared to what we really want. The Guzman's the example I gave you in the beginning. There's a there's an obvious problem with respect to wants versus haves with the Guzman's. And that's what gets people into trouble. Try to find one variable expense, not a fixed. Fixed expenses are there. We cannot do much about it. But any expense that's variable, try to find and identify one that we can eliminate or reduce. It's an emotional stage step. It's a difficult step, but it does require discipline whether it's entertainment expense or whatever. Pay yourself first. Treat savings as a recurring expense, please, as a fixed recurring expense. And if you identify a line in the budget, written budget, savings each month, then it becomes normal. It's an expense that will be taken into consideration when we look at the bottom line. Doesn't have to be a savings. It can be a retirement account or a 529 college plan for the children, or an HSA account, health savings account as well. Anywhere we can save on a normal basis. And again, finally, we should always try not to quit. It's very easy to do that, especially if you do not like the results. We tend to do that. I've done it before myself. We don't like what we see, so we stop doing it. But please continue to track, monitor the budget. The next thing that I'd like to discuss, please, is moving to more into stocks, bonds, and mutual funds investing. Now, stocks investing, we're talking about mostly common stocks here, because that's where majority of the people invest some of obviously have preferred stock as well but common stocks or common shares are more common where most people would invest obviously when we talk about the fundamentals of stocks investing demand and supply play a good important role in in stock values stock prices going up or down well, look, we cannot do anything about that. It's overall supply and demand. A lot of the experts look at two different types of analysis when they look at investing in stocks or determining which, are, which stocks are worth investing or divesting, technical and fundamental analysis. They look at the historical pattern, which is quite common. And they also look at the fundamentals with respect to the corporation's profits, revenues, and various economic conditions. I don't have a suggestion for you how you would review stocks, but all I can say is do your research, do not jump into it. Please, we always tend as human beings to get into the, mar into the stock and purchase a stock at the wrong time and sell it at the wrong time. I'm sure you heard about that. Someone tells me, oh, this is a great stock to buy. I believe him or her, but I want to see for myself. So we tend to procrastinate. Well, I'm going to check it myself. And I keep checking it every day for a while to make sure that that person is correct. Finally, I say to myself, my gosh, I should have really invested in this stock when that person told me because it's really gone up. And now finally, I jump into it. Guess what happens? It starts to go down because we tend to procrastinate as human beings. So as the stock price continues to go down, I start to get nervous. Oh, I must sell it. Oh, I must sell this stock. It was, a, it was a not a good investment. 
So again, as human beings, we procrastinate. We're going to wait until we are sure that it's not going to, is 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 going to, that it, it it whether it continues to go down, that it doesn't go back up again. And finally, we decide to sell it because it's gone down enough. We cannot sleep at night. And the minute we sell it, it starts to go back up. So we've gotten in at the wrong time, out at the wrong time. Advisors say that ideally, do not, not to get emotional, leave it alone. And we've seen that pattern many, many times over the past many, many years. Yes, it's going to go down, but the next time it comes up, it comes up even more than it did, did it, it was before. It's a long-term investment. That's my point. Stocks perform in theory, again in theory, better during low interest rate environment. So you ask yourselves, while interest rates are so low, down to 0% set by the central bank, why are stocks not doing as well as they were before? Well, the reality is the fact that there are other things happening today. So the current environment shows the fact that we have a very narrow range of sectors, industries, that are driving the stock prices up or down. Entertainment, service, technology. So it's not a broad market pattern that we see today, especially with regard to pandemic. There are huge institutional investors who are driving the market. While most in individual investors are staying on the sidelines. They're building up cash. Today, more people are putting the money in a savings account, those that are typically used to investing and staying on the sidelines, mainly because obviously, because of the upcoming elections and the pandemic. Now, while stocks pay dividends, not all do, some stocks do, bonds pay interest. It's a fixed coupon interest. Are bonds safer than stocks? Well, it depends. They're long-term investments, just like stocks should be. We don't, may, we don't always think stocks are long-term investment, but their bonds are also long-term investments. So what I wanted to do is just quickly cover the relationship between market interest rates going up or down set by the Federal Reserve and bond values. They behave inversely. So again, the coupon bonds pay fixed coupon interest to investors. The coupon interest earned is based upon the bond price, which is always set at $1,000 per bond. If it's a 3% fixed coupon interest rate, the investor would earn 3% of $1,000 paid semi-annually in terms of coupon interest. However, subsequent to investing in bonds, if the market interest rates set by the Fed go, goes up or down, the bond values are going to change again in a reverse pattern if you decide you want to sell your bond so today yes there are individuals that invested in bonds between 2016 2019 up until perhaps early this year when market rates were going up 
the U.S. treasuries and many other bonds were paying higher interest rates, not, not historically high, but they were offering up to 3% interest rate per year on certain bonds, longer term bonds. Today, the same bonds are paying less than 1% because market rates have declined. So those individuals that invested in these bonds several years ago and were earning much higher interest rates, they will continue to earn higher interest rates on the bonds. While anyone else that wants to buy the similar bond today will earn a lower rate because market rates have declined. However, those individuals that have high interest rate bonds that they invested in before have the ability to sell them on the secondary market. If they sell the bond, they can sell them at a premium because their bonds are more desired than current bonds offered by the issuers because the rates are low. Why are their bonds desired? Because they are offering a higher interest rate. When the bonds switch hands, coupon interest rate does not change. Whoever purchases a bond will continue to earn the 3% interest rate that was earned by the previous investor. But that same individual could actually go into the market today and buy a brand new bond will only earn 1% interest. So therefore, in order to earn the higher interest from the previously purchased bond by the previous investor, they would have to pay a premium. Means the price of the bond would be more than $1,000. While the other investor would make, generate a capital gain, any amount over the $1,000 that they paid for several years ago, the new investor would end up paying that higher price. Alternatively, if interest rates were to decline, of course, bond prices go up, but if market rates were to rise, the reverse occurs. Now today, that's not the environment we are in. Bond prices will decline. So any individual today that is buying a bond today at a much lower interest rate, these are longer term bonds. When market interest rates rise, eventually, if they have to sell that bond, their bond will not be as desired by the investor because this, their bond is offering a much lower interest rate when market interest rates have gone up on similar bonds. In order for me to sell that bond, if it was me, which I purchased, invested in at a lower rate, I would receive less than, less than $1,000. My bond would be sold at a discount and I will have a capital loss. So capital losses incur, occur, in, are incurred if market rates rise subsequent to investing in a bond. Capital gains incur if market rates have declined subsequent to me investing in the bond. It's all a matter of, by the way, the desirability of the bond and what the coupon interest rate is offering compared to the current market rates. Longer term bonds, of course, have a higher risk of in terms of values going up and down compared to shorter term bonds. Why? Because longer term bonds are for many, many years. If market rates have risen, an individual can go out and invest in a similar bond and could earn a higher interest for many, many years. But because your bond is offering a lower interest for the next 20 years, if it's a longer term bond, that individual who's going to want to buy your bond is going to ask, is going to ask for a much lower price because now that person is losing coupon interest rate the differential between 
the current high rate that they can get and the rate that you are willing to offer in your bond for 20 to 25 years. That's a long time to earn a lower coupon interest rate. So the longer the, that, 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 that effect and the differential on those bonds, the lower the price. So longer term bonds tend to be more risky in terms of change in value of the, of the bond. Let me give you an example of Argentina bonds. Today, Argentina, rather seven years ago, seven years ago, Argentina was offering 100-year bonds. So is Australia. These governments are offering 100-year bonds. Who would like to invest in 100-year bonds? Well, there were many, many individuals that jumped into it to buy 100-year bonds. They can pass it on to their beneficiaries, of course, those bonds. They can sell them early. But what drove them to a 100-year bond seven years ago? The economy was doing very well in Argentina at that time. And the interest rates are higher the longer the term of the bonds much higher than Argentina bonds that had a 30-year term. But again, as I pointed out to you, the longer the term of the bond, if interest rates were to rise, there's a bigger drop in the value of that bond than a 30-year bond, because it's for such a long period of time where the coupon interest is fixed. Today, Argentina has economic crisis. The, 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 the new government of Argentina decided that they're going to offer, give, give a choice to the, those investors that invested in 100-year bonds seven years ago. The government says the fact that those bond values have gone down because Argentina's interest rates have skyrocketed to 50%, very high. So there is a huge decline in value of the bond between what they were earning seven years ago, much lower. When the economy was good, the rates were lower. So the government of Argentina proposed that anyone wants to give up their bond, they can do that. How much did they receive? For every $1,000 they invested in a bond, they received $550. That is a discount of $450, almost to half. So they lost half the value in seven years. Now that's an extreme case, but again, it clearly shows that the longer the term of the bond, the greater the potential loss if market rates were to rise. The current environment in the US with the with the current policy by the Fed, historically low interest rates, returns for existing bondholders have risen. Again, those individuals that invested in bonds when rates were much higher, if they wanted to sell those bonds, because rates are down to almost 0% today, set by the central bank, long-term bonds are offering less than 1% while these individuals are earning much higher than 1% interest on their bonds, their values have gone up if they wanted to sell them. But it's a, it's a paper gain right now, unless they want to actually unload that bond and sell it. But they would incur a capital gain, of course, and they will have to pay tax on that. Mutual funds. Mutual funds, sell shares to individuals, and of course, they invest in stocks or bonds. These are companies, they're open and closed and mutual funds. Larger percentage of mutual funds are open and mutual funds. So I'm going to cover that. Of course, mutual funds, by the way, they would allow individuals to invest in small denominations. 
but on a more frequent basis for retirement purposes, to save for, for children's college education, while individuals are putting away smaller amounts, but on a, on a recurring basis, whether it's every two weeks, every month, or whatever. And what mutual funds do is that they pool the funds from all these different investors. And they would then buy shares of stocks or bonds. So investors purchase shares directly from the mutual fund companies. Example, Fidelity Investments, Vanguard, Genus, American Fund. There are many, many different mutual fund companies across the world. There are 25 mutual fund companies that are the largest. They hold billions and trillions of dollars that they've invested over time. And investors can sell back their mutual funds if they wish to, back to the mutual fund. So investors here do not have to find a buyer like stocks or bonds to sell them. They can sell them back to the mutual fund companies. $55 trillion throughout the world are invested in mutual funds. A lot of that is in retirement. About 50% of US households today own mutual funds. And 23% of the US households financial assets are in mutual funds. And the remaining 77% are in other savings, stocks, bonds, real estate, insurance, life insurance, etc. What are the incentives? Again, as I pointed out to you, we can invest as low as $10 a month or whatever. We don't have to have larger amount to invest. While to buy a stock or a bond, a $10 is not going to go anywhere. We're going to incur fees, brokerage fees, whether it's with uh, an online broker, whether it's E-Trade, or a discount broker, or an investment bank. There are fees to be paid when we purchase or invest in stocks or bonds, individual stocks or bonds. Most mutual funds do not charge any upfront fee. They provide investment diversification because mutual funds typically will invest will invest in a variety of stocks or bonds. Again, we do not have a choice as in, in mutual funds, an investor does not have a choice which particular stock or bond we would invest in. We can di dictate a particular industry we like to invest in, whether it's international stocks, domestic stocks, whether it's technology stocks, or more diversified stocks. The mutual fund company is going to take your request, and they have a family of funds that provide different choices. So we are able to take our $10 that we invest on a monthly basis and be able to buy a fraction of different stocks and bonds that we would own. And over time, by investing $10 every month over several years, now our portfolio is increasing with change in value as well. We call them low or no load funds. What we mean by that is that these are mutual funds they charge a very low upfront commission or they do not charge any commission at all. 95% of the mutual funds do not charge any commissions. Some of the biggest names such as Fidelity, Vanguard, Genus, Principal Fund, American Fund, many of these do not charge any upfront fee. But there is a management fee, of course, that we'll talk about later but it's not relatively high compared to investing individually in stocks or bonds. And more importantly, we are able to invest in small denominations, which otherwise we cannot, and provides investment diversification as well. 
Portfolio managers provide expertise. They manage the portfolio. Many of them are certified financial analysts as well. But they decide which stocks or bonds to buy and sell. Most mutual funds offer a family of mutual funds to investors where you as an investor have a choice. You can dictate that. You can break up your $10, split it up into four different types of mutual funds that I'm showing at the bottom. You can invest in stocks, bonds, have some in cash. It's your choice. You can change it anytime. You can change your allocation of your investment anytime. Most co companies um, there are large companies and many of the mid-sized companies are offering employees to be able to automatically take money out of the paycheck, either for investing in mutual funds or for retirement purposes. You can set it up whereby money is taken out of your paycheck. You can dictate by, by informing your HR. Most companies provide certain mutual fund companies that you can select from. You can change mutual fund companies anytime. You can change the type of mutual fund that you'd like to invest in. But again, please remember, mutual funds are long-term investments. We don't want to keep changing our mix, changing mutual fund companies all the time. It's best to, to continue consistently invest and then monitor it on a monthly basis on a monthly basis that's why the investments in mutual fund is 55 trillion dollars it has grown these are the different types of mutual funds that individuals can select based upon their goal and and risk tolerance Growth and capital appreciation, mutual funds, they are designated that, are those that do not pay dividends. But the profile of these stocks is that there is a higher appreciation of value of the stock. Netflix, um, Alibaba, I mean, some of the companies that many of us hear about, are included in this growth and capital appreciation. They do not pay dividends, but they have a higher potential for increase in value. Of course, they could go down dramatically as well. So they are much more volatile relative to the overall market. Growth and income are those that pay both dividends and there is a, a lesser appreciation than growth and capital appreciation. So they, they grow over time. McDonald's, Home Depot, these are examples. Procter & Gamble, General Mills. Sector are relatively more risky because there is very little diversification. You can dictate that you would like to invest X percent of your money in entertainment sector. Well, today it is not performing very well. It did very well for the past few years. So they are much more volatile. You can dictate the technology sector, banking sector. So again, it is particular industry, more volatile than growth and income. International stocks and bonds, of course, are those that are invested in companies or governments located in other countries. They tend to be more, again, volatile because now we're dealing with economies in various countries. There are also international stocks that are designated where they are invested only in China, Chinese companies, or Japan, or Pacific countries or Europe, European countries. So you can actually, if you feel comfortable with a particular um, market, you can also look for that. 
Index funds, they have become very popular in the recent past, mainly because these are types of mutual funds that invest in stocks that closely match an index, such as the NASDAQ, the FTSE 100, the S&P 500. So these move in the same pattern as the movement of the index. They don't invest in every one of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500, but they will invest in only those companies that are within that. So please remember, just because the Standard & Poor's index went up by 1% today, at the end of the day today, that doesn't mean that your mutual fund went up by 1% because your mutual fund is invested in only several of these 500 companies. And it all depends upon how they are performing. The overall S&P is up 1%, but not necessarily those stocks. They may Some of them may have come down. Some of them may have even gone up more than 1%. It all depends upon which stocks has the portfolio manager invested in. Target funds, again, probably more even more important. Target funds, by the way, have become a, become a popular mutual fund for many individuals that are starting to invest. What target funds are actually life cycle funds, whereby these are on autopilot. What I mean by that, is that as the individual ages, the mutual fund itself is going to reallocate your investment from being more aggressive in the early ages to becoming more conservative in the latter ages because the person is closer to retirement. So there is a shift, an automatic reallocation, and it's something that a lot of individuals prefer today because then they can just continue to invest and forget about it. Let somebody else do the reallocation. ETFs, by the way, the difference here is key difference is that these are stocks or bonds as well, but they trade on a daily throughout that there is intraday trading occurring in ETFs. Mutual funds that we talked about above, they cannot be traded until the end of the market. So whatever price that you want to buy or sell mutual funds on a given day, we receive the price at the when the market closes at 4 p.m. So there is no intraday uh, allowed. That's a regulatory requirement. Okay. So again, we monitor how the stock is performing. If you wanted to sell a, mut a particular mutual fund, if the value, if the price is, if the mutual fund is, if, if the stock prices that the mutual fund is invested in is, you can look it up online, of course, is doing very well. Or if the overall stock market is doing much better throughout the day, then you may want to sell it because now you can get a higher price. But don't sell until later, just before the market closes. But don't wait until quarter to four because then a lot of people are doing the same thing and you may not be able to put through your online trade with the mutual fund in time and it may go through after 4 p.m. So avoid waiting that long. But we cannot, there's no intraday trading on mutual funds. ETFs, on the other hand, do allow intraday trading. That's the key difference. What are advantages of mutual funds? They're convenient, as we talked about, for retirement. They are self-managed. You decide what sectors you want to invest in, what type of stocks that you'd like to invest or bonds you'd like to invest in. They do not provide any advice. Please, unlike, unlike a financial advisor who is managing your portfolio, who's providing with advice on buying or selling certain securities, mutual funds do not provide advice. You must review a prospectus that is available to you online or in print, which they provide to you. You should review it, make sure the fact that this is an investment that you like to invest in, do a thorough educational decision. There's flexibility. 
you can move your funds. It provides economies of scale, mainly because of mutual funds are trading in large quantities. Remember, they pull funds from all the individuals who are in, 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 invest, investing in their mutual fund, whether it's stocks or bonds. The trading fees are lower because of the economy of scale, because they, they, are, they are trading more shares or bonds with a fixed transaction cost. You can achieve dollar cost averaging. Certain times the market may be high or low, depending upon when you are, of course, having investing periodically into a mutual fund. So if the price is lower, you are buying more shares. If the price is higher, you're buying lower, less shares. In both cases, it's a benefit. So if the price is low, you're buying more shares. Now you'll have more shares, the price could go up. While if the price is high, you're buying less shares, so that the damage is not as much. And that is data cost averaging. You are able to automatically achieve that in recurring investments. Please keep in mind that mutual funds are not insured, like bank deposits. They're an investment. They do not provide advice, investment advice. There is a management fee charged. We must always be aware of what is known as the management fee. The, the prospectus is gonna provide that to you. You can go online and look it up anytime regarding your mutual fund, what the management fee is. Typically, Vanguard and Fidelity investments funds charge the lowest management fees. They range from 0.05% of the amount invested, which is less than one-tenth of 1%, half of less, less half of one-tenth of 1%, or up to as high as maybe 0.5%, 0 0.5%, half a percent. While there are other mutual funds that charge a much higher management fee. Lower the fee, the better, because fees are taken out of your returns. That could lower your returns if they're high fees as well. Fees are charged because they have to pay a portfolio manager, the investment analyst, and there are operating expenses. Again, as I pointed out to you, 95% of the mutual funds do not charge upfront brokerage fee, broker fee, but they do, all of them, all of them do charge management fees. You lose loss of control, mainly because of the fact that there's no intraday trading. You have to wait until the end of the day to determine what the sell or the buy price is, except for ETFs. Let me talk about allocation, please. I'd like to share a couple of things with you. Please monitor your investment. Don't get overly, you know, don't try to monitor on a daily basis. It's very stressful. You'll find the right time for you to be able to monitor it, whether it's weekly, monthly, or whatever. Take a look at the investment return in a particular portfolio relative to the overall portfolio return. And if you find that the investment return on a particular investment within your portfolio is not doing very well, and, and, and it, it, it continues not to do well, you may decide to reallocate those funds to those that are generating higher uh, returns. Again, be, being very careful that we don't get too emotional with that and get in and out at the wrong time. Invest in a mix of stocks, bonds, real estate investment trusts, and cash. Real estate invest, investment trusts, companies that actually are involved in, in purchasing, invest, in investing in investment property, commercial buildings, apartments, etc. And they pass and investors invest money. And these REITs, would pass on to the, back to the investors a share of the returns. An investor in a real estate investment, investment trust does not receive any profits from the sale of the property. They typically get a, a, a return on an, on, an, no, on an ongoing basis from the earnings and the investment earnings 
from those investments. Stocks and bonds are not correlated. So again, you can reallocate. Stocks behave inversely to bonds in normal conditions. Allocate specific weights, please. What percentage you like to invest in what type of investments? Cash, stocks, bonds, and then reevaluate it frequently. Rebalance your portfolio. Again, change this, the weights. What percentage of the portfolio is in what type of investment? Again, remember, we have many, many different types of mutual funds as well that you can change your reinvestment portfolio. As I pointed out to you, life cycle mutual funds provide an automatic reinvestment allocations. So if you are not interested in trying to monitor, monitor the allocation yourself, life cycle mutual funds are a good choice. There is automatic asset reallocation. It provides the right balance based upon your age. It doesn't change every year, but perhaps there is range of years when the mutual fund portfolio manager will shift your investment into more conservative as you age. Achieve steady decrease in risk as you age. It takes into consideration your risk tolerance, of course. The disadvantage with the life cycle, which are target mutual funds, which could go up to 2050, 2060. So if you are retiring, if you expect to retire in 2050, you can invest in a 2050 target fund. So between now and 2050, your portfolio will be automatically reallocated as you age over the next 30 years or whatever your retirement age happens to be. It's on autopilot. That means the fact that you lose the ability in a life cycle mutual fund to be able to dictate which types of mutual funds you want to invest in. So basically what I'm saying is that you cannot dictate which of these mutual funds you lose that ability because the portfolio manager is going to actually reallocate that according to your life cycle or the expected retirement age that you, you have dictated. I just wanted to share with you a couple of things. I know that we're running out of time. Um, one is the life cycle fund. So here is just an example of how conservative to aggressive investment, depending upon how many years left to retirement. And at the bottom, you'll be able to see the actual reallocation of funds. An aggressive at a young age, 50% of the funds on average are invested in large cap stocks, large company stocks, while anyone that has three or five years before retirement, more conservative, only 15% is invested in stocks and more in bonds. So again, um, I'll let you review this when it is posted. The other thing that I wanted to quickly show you, please, is that it's always good to increase your investment, max out the 401k plan at work. This shows that a person that did not increase their um, mutual fund investment in a retirement fund and the one that actually did increase it. And the difference is quite dramatic, almost quarter of a million dollars or more. So again, max out, continue to increase based upon your um, income. You can start out with a lower investment in retirement and continue to increase over time. What I also have is 
I'd be more than glad to have Christy provide this information to everyone because I don't have enough time to cover it. I don't want to go over, please. This is a very, very busy document. It provides us the current rules with respect to IRAs, 401ks, and the Education 529 plans. It talks about the tax benefits of each, what they are, what are the maximum income levels to be able to qualify, the difference between Roth and traditional IRAs, difference between Roth and traditional 401ks, and also at the bottom, the Education 529 plans. I also talk about the latest SECURE Act, which was passed on the first of the year by the US government. That act changed certain things when the minimum required distribution must be made by the individual. If you are an older age, you can wait until 72 to do that compared to 70 and a half. This year, because of the pandemic, the required minimum distribution is not required, which generally is required each year for someone that has reached that age, mainly because the government has allowed individuals not to take the RMD, which is a minimum required distribution this year. I also talk about with the new SECURE Act that if any amount within the IRAs or 401ks are passed on to heirs, not a spouse, but to children or anyone else. They must now begin to withdraw that funds within the next 10 years before they could actually keep those funds that they have they have inherited for the life for their throughout their lifetime. Now that's been reduced 10 years. They don't have to withdraw every year. They can withdraw whatever is what are all the funds within the next on the 10th year if they wanted to but they're going to take a very high income tax hit at that point because if it's in a traditional ira or a traditional 401k you have not paid taxes on those because those are tax deferred whoever inherits that will have to pay the tax when they withdraw it so it's best to try to distribute it over 10 years rather than take all of it out in one year. Any Roth IRAs or Roth 401ks also requires 10 years distribution by the, those that have inherited, but those do not require income tax to be paid by them because you have already paid those. Those are after-tax contributions. So I'm going to let Christy provide this document to you. I know that I'm, I'm well over my time. So I'm going to stop here. Excellent. Uh, I, I, I apologize for going over. Oh, Professor Suchek, thank you so much. Um, just such a wealth of information that you shared with us today. I did want to let everyone know we did go ahead and upload the handout right to go to webinar. So if you'd like to download that today before the closing of the webinar, go right ahead and do so. We will make sure um, we send it tomorrow as well as mentioned in the chat, but it is uploaded in GoToWebinar. So feel free to download it so you have it at your fingertips. Um, some great information. Uh, Professor Sutek, thank you again. Um, it was such a pleasure uh, getting to um, work with you and hear from you today. Uh, so grateful on behalf of the entire Office of Alumni Engagement and the UB School of Management. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. We've had some great questions come in. I'll work with uh, Sudhir to get those questions answered, and we'll go ahead and just email you individually um, some of those answers and responses. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. In addition, save the date. We are in our homecoming at home. We're celebrating all week. We have another special webinar presentation for you tomorrow. Um, it's titled City of My Heart, Intimate Reflections and Recollections of Buffalo, New York from 1967 to 2020. 
we will be um, with the author of that book, UB alumnus Mark Goldman, who will be sharing some insights on that. So again, another presentation tomorrow. Um, in addition to all of our exciting Homecoming at Home events and programs, we will make sure we send you the link in the follow-up email uh, to this presentation as well. Um, we also have all of our webinar um, uh, upcoming webinars and our archive library on our website as well. We'll make sure to include that um, tomorrow um, with all of today's information. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to our featured presenter, Professor Suchek, for any closing remarks. Well, uh, thank you again. I, I appreciate the patience. I appreciate everyone joining here uh, today. Uh, as I pointed out to you earlier, this is, this is a, I teach a course like this throughout the semester. <laughs> both for the MBAs as well as for the undergrads here at the University of Buffalo. So it's a quite a bit of information and I'll be more than glad to answer those questions that you have posed. And, and, and Christy, if you could just provide those answers to everyone. Absolutely. You, It'll be my pleasure. Professor Suchek, thank you so much for joining us. All of our UB alumni and friends, thank you for joining us today from wherever you may be, whether it's in the Buffalo, Western New York area or around the world. We're so grateful to have you on with us today. Stay tuned for our upcoming slate of webinars. We'll make sure we share that. Take care, stay well, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.